Okay, everybody, thanks for being here. <laughs> I'm getting the thumbs up from behind the camera. So thank you. I'm Jessica Becker. I think you mostly know who I am. And I'm really happy to have Mark here. Mark Google from the NEH um, is in town for the uh, a conference. He'll tell you about perhaps. And um, he's going to spend about five minutes or so going over some kind of main questions. And then we'll open it up to hear from all of you. I don't think we'll spend the time introducing whoever's on the call, uh, but I will share a, a sh uh, sheet of participants after afterwards so that you can um, be in touch with each other and Mark will share his contact information. And then you also have, um, in addition to me here from the Wisconsin Humanities Council, we have Meg Turville Heights, who is the grant program director for the um, <laughs> The camera right now. She wants you to know. Um, she is the grant program director for the Wisconsin Humanities Council. So, in case any questions can be um, fielded by Meg, she's here. And we also have Dina, uh, Dina Wurzel, who's the director of the Humanities Council. So, Mark, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And I, I really mean that. Dina, Jessica, everyone here, thanks for having me in. We don't get out to Wisconsin as often as we should. So, this is an incredible mm -hmm. opportunity for me, I think to hear from you. So I wanna make sure that that's the primary drive of this call uh, or this session or whatever we wanna call it. Um, but yeah, I'm Mark Ruppel from the NEH, Division of Public Programs. I lead a grant line there called Digital Projects for the Public. And it's the NEH's pri primary flagship uh, publicly facing <coughs> digital projects grant line. And I'll differentiate that from um, some of the other programs that we offer in a bit, and I'm happy to answer specific questions about it as we, we roll on, but uh, what we do in public programs really is what it, the, the name really does suggest. We fund museum exhibits, film, radio, documentary, uh, television programming, podcasts now, short videos, and of course, digital projects that include games, mobile apps, VR, AR, the kind of cutting edge of things that we're seeing to start to land in museums, in cultural spaces. Um, and increasingly, uh, hybrid projects, ones that may exist in some ways as an exhibit on site somewhere or a historic site on site, and then a curated space online that allows for audiences to experience it outside of that actual space. So we'll get into that stuff in a second, but I know that one of the primary questions that's always worth answering here is just what it takes to apply to the NEH. So our eligibility requirements haven't changed all that much over the years. And you do have to come in primarily as either a 501c3 yourself or partnering with an organization that is a 501c3. We fund institutions, but we also fund individuals and projects on that. End. And that's a huge differentiation point between us and the Arts Endowment that mostly funds either institutions or organizations that work across a community, but not specific projects. In our case, and especially in public programs, we really are looking to fund projects that specifically exist in the humanities to communicate, to tell stories across a certain set of content, across people, places, events. And because of that, we're really open to the types of, of applicants that come in here. But the key facet is that 501c3 status. You have to be a nonprofit or working with one in order to be eligible. And I can't say enough how much it matters to start to sort that stuff out as quickly as possible because there's been changes in grants.gov where you'll need to enter um, this information in order to apply. There's things like SAMS registration and DUNS numbers and all sorts of acronym that we don't even want to touch in this, this particular <laughs> section because it, it takes hours to explain. But trust me, these things take time and they make a huge difference if you wait until the end um, on whether you can even hit that deadline. So one of the first things that we always recommend people do if they're even considering applying to the NEH is sorting out that side of things. Um, but in terms of the actual makeup of the types of institutions and people that we see, and we see that from every single swath of both public life, academic life, um, from the cultural glam sector, galleries, libraries, art museums, and those spaces. And then we also see them increasingly from the media side as well, where we're seeing producers who may have worked in film or may have worked more broadly in media production or game production who are attempting to cross over to the humanities to do the kind of work that they're seeing is increasingly vital uh, in order to answer questions about their field or answer questions about a certain topic or communicate something and raise questions about um, any of the issues that we, we currently face. Um, 
A good question that I think also tends to come up sometimes is whether the entire project itself has to be humanities focused. And that's always something for us that's a bit of a, a difficult one to ask because our answer really is that it depends on some level on the subject that you're dealing with, whether the project itself has to be exclusively in the vein of say history or literature, or philosophy, ethics, politics, something that we might associate more generally with the humanities. We have a, an unspoken initiative at the NEH that's in some of the guidelines, and I think it still exists in this way, um, that really encourages projects that explore the intersection, for example, between history and science and technology. And that means that oftentimes in projects like that, there is a significant STEM component that may creep in and may be part of some of the primary content there, whether that's an exhibit, a film, or a digital project in itself. But the thrust of the project and the interpretive lens that really matters, the framework, the foundation, does have to be at least primarily, at least at some portion, um, rooted in the humanities. And that's where we really encourage folks to go is, is really looking at their scholar team on that side. So if you're dealing with, say, a project that has to do with the history of, of smallpox inoculation, for example, um, you may very well have virologists or pathologists who are working on board with that project with you. But we would expect that the humanities lens would also include cultural studies folks, people who, are, who have dealt with, say, the history of the cultural and social and political dimensions of the spread of viruses, the, the dimensions that have to do more with who we are and how we, we responded to things as a community, as a culture. And in, within that space, um, there's a really productive dialogue to be had. So the scholars have to be involved on some level for everything that we do. That is the one requirement that we have here, and it is a key, key portion of what we do in public programs. Uh, we oftentimes say that we fund humanities content first, projects or platforms second, and I think that's a decent way to look at how our grant programs operate, because oftentimes the first things that we'll look at internally and our reviewers will really look at is that team of scholars, and more importantly, the way that they enunciate and communicate the humanities in a section that we have in all of our applications called basically the humanities content or humanities themed section. So in that event, and really in not communicating that and showing just how much your scholars and your team and your project is able to both synthesize what's taking place in a given field, but as well model some of the language that would really work for a general public, those sections are absolutely crucial. Um, so scholars do need to be involved. They need to be involved substantially. We will help you pay them to be involved. We will get them on board with NEH stipends or whatever it may take. And one of the keys to success, and I'll certainly you know, mention this, I think, uh, ad nauseum today, is that you really do have to figure out ways of getting their feedback over the course of the entirety of the project. So these aren't just initial consultations, but if you were writing, say, a film script, they may help you to boundary some of that content initially, give you a sense of what's taking place in the field. And crucially, that doesn't need to be bleeding edge. It needs to just be a good representation of what's taking place from this scholars, from this research perspective. But then we also would expect that down the line, they may be there to read a draft. They may be there to look at the finished product before it moves on to the next stage. Now, one of the difficulties that we often hear from applicants is that there is it seems at least a somewhat unspoken expectation that those scholars are involved long before any H money that is actually entering into the picture. And I think that's actually a fairly um, accurate assessment on some level. And I do think that that input outside of the grant process should have been at least partially baked into the project prior to even coming into a planning grant. And what we mean by this is that it doesn't have to be substantial, but it nonetheless has to reflect in some ways what's taking place from those scholars' perspectives. In other words, we want to hear their voices in the application. We want to imagine and project forward where they may be going in terms of their feedback, just how much of their perspective is going to actually be possible if, say, you're developing a mobile app or something like that that deals with local history. Will these scholar voices come through? Um, but really, in the end, that is what our primary goal is, and it's the mission of public programs to support that work and translate this kind of scholarship and research for a general public audience. So you only need to go so far because the rest is honestly what our money goes to. And we were very, very happy to pay it. Um, as far as defining who scholars are on these projects too, I think there's 
some big distinctions or big um, assumptions oftentimes that this always means academic positions, chairs, research folks, the kind of people at R1 institutions, but that's simply not the case because oftentimes in projects, whether it's a historic site or a museum or, or an archival space, the experts are sometimes in the room. And I mean that quite literally, um, in the sense that when you're dealing with a body of content, like at say the Huntington Library, somebody who's working on Thoreau would find that the key scholars may be sitting right next to them, showing them through the collection, guiding them on, in that process. So we don't need this to be skewed towards just university faculty. In fact, I think a project that goes there exclusively oftentimes runs into a bit of myopia, or at least a bit of a, a cloistered perspective on their topic. The one thing that we always recommend, and I think it's good advice for any project, even outside of the NEH, is to make sure that there are other voices in the room outside of that space. So if you do have the experts or the expertise in-house, we oftentimes will encourage you to bring in another couple voices to provide a different sort of context, to be that, whether it's a voice of dissension or a voice of, of unison, to give a different way of, of potentially approaching that. So a project that might deal with civil rights history, for example, we may encourage someone um, who may have local scholars on that expert to get somebody from outside of the space to deal with the national context, or somebody who's dealing with gender studies, for example, to actually in integrate some of that type of perspective into the project there. Um, as a whole, though, I, I think that what we also do, and this is a more subtle point, in looking at the scholar team, you're also in some ways looking at ways of understanding audiences within that space. Um, so again, we do accept and we completely understand that the best sense of that is often in-house at the applying institution, but to, these projects should be brought in a way that we'd hope um, would incorporate audiences outside of maybe the initial um, impact area, in other words. So bringing in someone from an institution across the state or from out of state may give you a perspective on how to reach audiences outside of your own vicinity. And while I'm raising that point too, I think there's oftentimes another assumption in NEH that a lot of what we do has to be national in orientation all the time in order for it to be funded. We do want our projects to have a big impact. We hope that they're not regional projects that reach maybe 100 or 200 people, but we also allow for the fact that regional projects are oftentimes the most impactful way for, for actual humanities work to, to be communicated and to have its deepest, longest, most nuanced impact. So what we oftentimes do with, with projects when we're evaluating in that sense is we'll look at the entirety of our, of our portfolio and we ask ourselves that. Do we have a national reach over the composite of our projects, over our, the entirety of what we funded? Are we hitting these bases? Are we hitting different audience types? Are we hitting different regions? And that matters to us internally simply because our mission is, as public programs, uh, to really reach the U.S. public with humanities content where they will go where they need it, where they see it, and where they, you know, in some ways will be uh, in the future uh, consuming it um, online, offline, in spaces like that. So your project does have to really have a sense of your audience. You have to have a sense of the outreach. The scholars and the humanities team needs to really reflect some of that. But if you have a great idea for a project that may explore your area, that may be targeted towards, you know, a decent swath of the population within your space, we are all for that, and, and we're really, really happy to support those kind of projects. Now, again, it, it's been my general experience that projects that start like that, that actually wind up looking elsewhere, or have cross-communication between different communities, or work across different spaces or institutions, always wind up being more robust and more surprising and more vibrant in some way. So we will encourage you to explore those kind of networks in order to see what's possible with a certain space. But we are more than happy to fund a project that does reflect a perspective, a community that services those needs in some very, very unique ways. Um, let's see, any questions coming up? I should stop there, take a sip of my coffee and uh, catch, catch my breath, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions about what I just said before I move on just a couple, to a couple other things here. Yeah, if anybody has a question, um, you can unmute yourself and jump in or add something. Um, looks like, okay, I, I saw something come through on the chat, but um, it's not a question. If anybody wants to throw something onto the chat, 
on the right hand side of the screen. You're welcome to do it and I'll take your question that way or you can unmute yourself and pop in. And I think maybe the most helpful thing then would be to go All on right. to some examples of projects that um, have been funded or were not successful for some reason. Sure, sure. And, that might and maybe also how much of your project needs to be different. Sure, sure. So I think that's a great question because when I initially approached Dean and her team just about speaking about what's taking place at NEH and the digital projects for the public grant program in particular, it occurred to me just how much of this is actually woven into some of our other programs too. So oftentimes, when we receive, say, an application for a media project, whether that's a film or it's a podcast or a radio program, there's oftentimes a digital component to that. So NEH and public programs really supports that across the board. Um, our museum exhibits, nine times out of 10, if we're funding them, they are going to have a significant online presence that's sometimes partially promotional. An awful lot of it, though, is actually curational. So what we'll see if someone comes in for a massive implementation grant or a smaller one for a museum exhibit is that a chunk of that budget will be dedicated towards the online experience of that content for people who either can't come to the, the site or who want to supplement that or use it in the classroom or use it for different learning purposes. So we support digital quite a bit in that way. Um, and we also support it through our community conversations grant line, which is tailored towards public programming particularly. So this means lectures, seminars, workshops, reading groups, the kind of things that really get audiences intimately involved with the humanities are increasingly um, being focused on either digital tools, digital projects, or using digital as a way of communicating some of this content or scaffolding some of those conversations. So I just want to be clear that we fund digital across the board here. So there's oftentimes, I think, some confusion as to where someone should come in. And the best advice that I usually give on that end is just to take a look at where the primary thrust of your budget is and then make decisions based on that. If your budget is going almost entirely towards the digital component of the project, then you should absolutely come in through our digital project for the public grant line. If you're splitting it in some ways between two different sections, well then talk to us. But for the most part, I'd probably suggest leading towards the non-digital grant line in order to supplement some of that. Um, because one of the things that we found as well is that say for example, you have a short video series that you're coming in with that's going to be hosted online, either through a proprietary website or something else. We just funded one of these at the planning stage, for example, for a project called Unladylike from the Futuro Media Group. It's a series of 35 and potentially more short films um, that's essentially exploring the unknown side of women's suffrage and will reach the public um, right around the anniversary of, of the suffrage. Um, and one of the remarkable things about it is that the project initially was considering coming into digital projects for the public. And because they felt that their, their project existed online, it was going to be staying there, you know, that's where the primary thrust of their outreach was going to take place. But we're recommending that podcasts, short videos, and spaces like that come in through our media projects grant line. Uh, simply because a lot of what's taking place with those projects have more to do with, say, a broadcast film or a radio program than they do with the somewhat more innovative spaces that we see projects like digital games or VR or um, mobile applications functioning in. So there are real distinctions to be made, and if I'm not making it clear enough, one of the best ways to sort through those is to talk to uh, your friendly neighborhood program officer, either here at the Humanities Council or us in DC. Um, we do work on proposals with you. We will find the right grant program for you. We'll help you talk through scholars and fields that need to be um, addressed in the project. And we'll even talk through some of the interactive points and some of the mechanics of the project. So in other words, we act as a co-producer on the front end there. And we really take that role seriously, not just because we meet so many incredible people and in projects, but because we want every project essentially to have a good chance of being funded. We need that to happen. You are the mission that is lived and real on the ground. We do not exist without your work. So we really want these projects to be as robust as possible. We want you to have a chance of really pushing through the review process as, uh, as cleanly as possible too. And we'll often give insights towards that and it's even as, uh, as shrewd as you know, what to expect from say the curmudgeon on the panel who may be taking shots at the project uh, in some ways. Um, so really, we, we expect that, you know, that in any project, the percentage that needs to be digital varies from project to project. 
if you're going into a public program and you want to support that work, but your primary thrust is, say, a digital game, you can ask for supplements within that grant process. Um, proposal itself to do say discussions or to do coding work with local school groups or to do that kind of stuff. There is room for both in everything, in other words, and we really hope you take advantage of that because uh, projects don't exist in one place, people don't exist in one place, and as good as some outreach strategies can be and as much buzz can be built about a project in one arena, the real impact, the real long tail of this work is, we hope, multifaceted and multi-located and, and really does have a way of growing into spaces that it may not have initially done. Um, so I think, you know, it's probably worth talking about a few projects that we funded recently. And I just want to mention too that one of the things I'm going to do after this, uh, this session concludes is save the slides that I, I have prepared with some of this stuff um, that have funded projects, tip for applications, outlining a few grant lines, um, both within and outside of public programs and building projects from there. Um, I will send that to everyone who's on here and everybody who's signed up for this. And I, with, again, the invitation to just give us a call and discuss this and give me a call personally to talk about any questions you have, any projects you want to, to work on. And I think I'd be remiss, actually, without mentioning our Office of Digital Humanities in the midst of this, too. We do fund digital across the agency, every division, including our research division, which primarily funds fellowships for monographs and books and projects like that, they also now have a born digital line. So in other words, you can actually apply for fellowships to do digital projects, digital monographs, things like that, that may be more research oriented. Um, our Office of Digital Humanities, though, is the primary side of the NEH that really does fund the R&D, that funds the innovative, the experimental, the research oriented work that's so, so crucial to moving forward both the academic study of the humanities, but also the larger space and larger field. So the ODH has funded a number of projects that have been absolutely crucial to establishing the field of the digital humanities as we know it. This is from text analyzers to the kind of thing that would study an entire corpus of a couple thousand books to the Digital Public Library of America, and also to more public facing type of projects that eventually have broken through on that side. So more recently, uh, the ODH funded a project called Pop-Up Archive, which is a simple toolkit for broadcasters and media producers and academics to use to both archive sound content, but also search it and make text searchable and make spoken words searchable in a way that they hadn't been before. I mention this simply because that breakthrough initially was very, very, um, uh, academically aligned and research oriented. And there was as many failures in the midst of that project as there were successes. But with NEH funds, they pushed through to the finish line and we recently heard they were actually bought out by Apple. Um, so there's a number of different ways that we support this work. The more bleeding edge stuff, the kind of things that has multiple uses, the kind of tools and research kits and infrastructures mm -hmm. that really do figure into archival processes, research oriented tasks or new types of of experimental ways of playing with the humanities like room scale virtual reality installations or things like that may be much better suited coming in through the Office of Digital Humanities. But again, we're here to discuss this and to differentiate this. And that gray area between the projects is actually a really, really productive one in that we do hope that there are some crossovers from the Office of Digital Humanities and those who go more public with their projects. And we funded a number of those who initially have come in through there to do infrastructure work, and then who have found their way into public programs to really take what they found and go large with it. Um, so we fund also a number of digital projects through our preservation and access program who do the really significant, crucial work of digitizing collections, of future-proofing archives, of allowing libraries to, to better service their public by adding to their digital infrastructures um, and then we also funded in our education division too through seminars and institutes that may focus in some ways um, on digital practices and digital, uh, digital leaning at least, uh, types of projects and, and processes. And one other newer grant program that we have is our infrastructure and challenge grants program. Um, this is its first real deadline um, occurred last Winter, and we're quite happy to say that uh, there's been a number of projects on that side that reflect both the traditional sense of what our challenge grants did, and that is to fund 
actual physical installations in buildings and spaces like that. But also on the infrastructure side, we gave a grant to WGBH out of Boston to take a look at their entire media library, digitize that, figure out ways to bring that to the public, and then build out an infrastructure that allows this to be a sustainable long-term practice. Um, so if you're interested in anything like that, these are much longer grants. They're much larger grants for that. There are matching requirements on that side. But we, feel, we felt it was very, very crucial to allow for the field to come back in too with projects that have already been established, projects that have done incredible things for the field, like the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, that are in need of a refresh or an upgrade or who need sustainable infrastructures involved there. So we also do allow for that in this program too. So if you know of any collections or projects or any sorts of things like that, endowed buildings or spaces that would be dedicated to the humanities, that may be a, a really, really fruitful grant line to pursue. Um, let me stop there before and ask if there's any questions coming up here and uh, I will get into some projects that we funded recently. Yeah, we have a question. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, this is, you're really covering a lot and it's really helpful. Um, we have a question from uh, coming out of La Crosse. Um, are there areas of the state where fewer applications have come from than others to the NEH? So La Crosse is, you know, La Crosse is, La Crosse is yeah. down in the southern western area of the state. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, you know, we, we try to do as best as we can to make sure that we're reaching out to organizations, too, that haven't come into the NEH for a while. We're trying to ensure that there are applications that aren't just coming from the cultural centers in some ways, but are reflective of what's taking place in the entirety of the state. Now, honestly, that's one of the biggest, biggest things that a lot of our outreach is going to be focusing on, um, at least from this point forward. We're really, really both excited but also concerned that we're not getting those voices in the room. Um, so to a large extent, yeah, we, we do not see as many proposals as we might like to from the, the spaces that aren't traditional NEH grantees, and we hope we can change that. But that's partially what I'm really thrilled about today because I wanna leave enough time to hear from you about what you're not seeing from NEH too. I mean, the truth is we want our guidelines as bureaucratic and heavy as they are to, be reflective of your work. We want you to see yourselves in them. We want you to see possibilities for your work, for your institution in our guidelines. We want those voices to be heard there. And the best way to do that is for you to talk to us and tell us what you need there. What do you need in terms of support for your projects? Is a planning grant at that level too far along already for what some of the fundamental questions are? Are there ways of talking about digital projects that we incorporate and we use that don't reflect the stages where you're at? and don't reflect your needs, that don't reflect the ways and the processes that you really uh, engage yourself with the project potentially down the line. So I am all ears for any suggestions you might have. We also do have programs like NEH on the road and spaces like that, traveling exhibits that oftentimes do hit smaller institutions in smaller areas or out of the way spaces, so to speak. And that's been a big, big vessel for us in getting this content out to the public. So if you're interested in hosting one of those exhibits, if you wanna push down that road, just look up NEH on the road and there's a very simple application process for it. We will send you the exhibits, we'll send you the artifacts, we'll send you toolkits, and we'll also give you a stipend to construct some programming around. So for people who haven't received an NEH grant initially or are wanting to get back into that space, it's oftentimes a good way to do it. But yes, I mean, in the long run, we wanna hear from more people um, from those spaces. And uh, I think we run, run the risk of ourselves being an echo chamber if we don't figure out ways of getting those voices in the room. Is there a place where people can easily search for projects in Wisconsin that have been funded? Yeah. Um, so if you go to securegrants.neh.gov, it's a very vanilla looking form, but is our grant query database. You can sort by region, you can sort by state, you can sort even by city or division or type of program. You can sort by keywords. You could sort, you can even look up just say projects with Wisconsin in their title or their description because some of this work likely has come from out of state. So you can find what's been funded on that end, but we also do have on our main website um, a way of searching through 
and sorting out projects that have taken place in each state and also active projects that are ongoing in each state as we speak. So that could be lecture series, that could be exhibits, it could be national broadcasts of a film hosted by a local station. Um, all of those sorts of things are available through the website and we're actually going to be upgrading our website within the next month or so to make that kind of information specifically that much more easy to find. Thank you. Um, I've got a, another couple questions here. Um, I'm going to take a question first from uh, Dustin. Dustin's asking if you could, he says thank you, and um, could you define projects that are regional in scope? Specifically, are you talking about county level, state, or Midwestern, in other words, regional? Um, so if you could take a minute. On sure. That. I mean, Dustin, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Essentially, all of those things. We have funded projects that have existed at a smaller county level that have run deeply through the institutions there, whether that's libraries, community centers, museums, historic sites. We have funded those um, quite a bit in, in both our traditional grant programs, our media and museums grant programs, but also increasingly our co community conversations programs that may find their way into a deep, robust, very community-driven type of discussion about humanities issues that are hitting close to home, very literally in some sense. Um, but we've also funded projects that exist as state initiatives. Michi Michigan Humanities, for example, received a community conversations grant about a year or two ago to actually implement a statewide uh, discussion program based on water and its use and its role, both socially, culturally, politically, and economically in the state. So this involved voices from Flint, but also voices from indigenous communities in the Upper Peninsula there, who really did feel as if their, their stake or their voices in some ways needed to be heard or needed to be culturally understood. Um, we funded projects though that cross state boundaries in that way as well, whether that's a shared traveling exhibit or a series of programs that actually works across different communities there. We are for all of those sorts of things. Again, the biggest, biggest thing that we really do look at in something like that is one, how well you know your audience and how well you can actually reach that audience with this content. Two, how relevant that content is to their daily lives. Does it involve, say, community-driven history projects or roundups of the sort that we're seeing increasingly? Um, are there digitization projects that are existing that allow for the community's voices to be heard? Or is this something that's taking place in a much more top-down, but equally potentially productive type of way? That content really matters on that side too. But three, you know, is this gonna be something with a long-term transformative um, role in that community. In other words, is a series of programs that may be set up to discuss, say, the role of immigration within a certain region, are there going to be transformative ways of integrating that into either programming locally or school curriculum or even just in the community itself? Are all those stakeholders involved? Are these conversations going to get you somewhere? Is that deepening of engagement with the humanities going to be something that's possible there? We want our projects to raise questions as well as they, they really offer answers, or at least multiple ways of viewing a situation. And those questions can linger on long past the grant deadline or the, the time that the grant actually closes out. However you situate the space of that project, though, is really up to you. And um, you know, while we, we certainly, as a national funder, want our projects to reach as many folks as possible, so if you're targeting, say, you're coming in with a, for a $400,000 ask, but you're only going to reach 40 people, well, the cost per head there might be a little bit skewed. So there are things to consider on that side too, but we'll work with you to figure out a budget that makes sense for the scope of your project. And that's part of our role is to figure out just how cost effective some of this may be too, and how well you can strategize on that and to make the best case for moving forward. Okay, thanks. I have, I wanted to say that um, Don has said, thank you so much, Don, um, at the University here in Madison and UW-Madison, and he says he's going to be sharing um, a lot of this information with the tribal communities he works with. Oh, great, so, great. Thank you. Can I say something to that Ed, real quick? Sure. Um, you know, I think that that's been a really crucial side of what we're trying to do at the NEH, and I think oftentimes one of the real difficulties that we see in projects that are either from a tribal institution or a tribal community or driven in partnership with those communities is an inability to mesh some of the processes that I think really, really matter on the ground there for those specific communities, for deliberate discussion, for allowing an organic way of discussing content 
and impact and legacy and mythology and all of the things that really should be a part of this, they don't mesh so well sometimes with modern timelines and they don't mesh so well with what we expect coming out of a project. We want to fund more of those projects. It is the crucial work of the humanities that we do that stuff. So we really ask that if you're working with those communities, get in touch with us as soon as possible. There are things that we can offer in terms of best practices that we've seen from unsuccessful proposals that hopefully will help you down the line because that work is absolutely vital to our mission and we cannot, we cannot fund enough of those types of projects. So thank you for your work on that. And, and I'm more than happy actually to do a separate session with you if you'd like, um, just to talk about you know, some possible projects, stuff we funded and ways to move forward on that side. Oh, great to hear, thank you. And maybe related, I've got um, a question coming from uh, Green Bay. Um, uh, again, about this regional and national point, but specifically, should applicants consider state humanities councils first before submitting a national application? Well, I'm going to open that up to you folks too, uh, okay. you know, because I think you probably have a perspective on that that I don't. Yeah, I mean, there's, I think, one of the real synergies that we hope exists between what we do in DC and what happens really on the ground in the really, really vital weeds here is that there is the potential for that kind of crossover. And that a project that does need funding to get off the ground or to really test an idea or to even complete their project on a scale that potentially might feed into a larger um, type of, of application or ask, the state councils are vital for that. Um, but you know, they're oftentimes an end in itself. One of my favorite digital projects that's come out over the last couple of years is called The Hollow. And it was funded through West Virginia Humanities, a smaller grant, but in many ways, it set the bar for what an interactive online documentary can be. It's the story of a small town that's dealing with industri deindustrialization. It includes oral histories, short documentaries, artifacts, narrative storytelling, and all sorts of things that I think is, are so elegantly meshed that it's kind of remarkable that what it's come from and what it's become really was genesis by a state council. I can't say enough how vital that kind of work is, and you never know where those sorts of things are. So yes, please talk to, to your humanities council, talk to your arts council, but sometimes they will also push you towards our direction here and, um, and, and you know, say essentially this is out of the scope for some of what we do. But yeah, please. Well, I mean, I, to, to clarify that for a little bit, um, are they able to use match um, from the NEH for a state project, right? So right. that can't, you know, so that can be kind of a limitation, but we have had um, programs that have mixed these two together to be able to expand their ability. And maybe the focus is, you know, community conversations yeah. for their um, grant from us, but your, you know, your grant may be a completely different. Yeah, project. that's a great point. Yes, you can fund different components of the project across these different spaces. And I would say too, that look, if you are doing something that does involve outreach to communities, no matter what format it is, you should be talking to your state council anyways, because there is no one better who knows how to get projects in schools, in other communities, in the spaces like Osher Lifelong Learning Centers and things like that, veterans communities, um, all of the sorts of vital, vital work and that kind of outreach that cuts across audience types happens with the state council. So we don't exist on so many fundamental levels without their work and their work on the ground, making this lived and real. Be in touch with them if you're thinking about, thinking about coming into NEH for anything that involves that sort of um, dynamic. Thank you. Um, so I think I just gave you more work, but. <laughs> <laughs> want, right? yeah, That's yeah. great. So I think we have a question coming from um, the Center for the Humanities. Uh, hi, Mark. Great. Uh, I just um, have a question about the media production grants. And sure. um, it's my sense is that it's important, has been in the past important to have broadcast partners on those. And I'm just wondering how NEH is responding as the broadcast world is really rapidly changing. And so the yeah. penetration of WGBH and you know, partners, you know, when you have online, you know, platforms that are really transforming what broadcast means and um, in applying for those media production grants, um, like uh, how one can use the kind of newer platform deliveries um, as a leverage point. Yeah, I think that's the key question for that. And you put your finger on a number of things there. 
one, that window really for finding that partner is shrinking quite a bit, as you know. And what we're seeing from a lot of stations in terms of their ability or willingness to carry a project is that unless they're in there on that bottom floor, if they're not there from the start of the project, they sometimes won't touch it. Um, and we think that's problematic for us as a funder because our traditional model has been working through those types of, uh, of organizations and networks. But we're trying to work through this on the same level I think you are. So we are okay, increasingly, I think, with projects that maybe do just have, you know, potentially regional carriage um, through a local station. Um, but we're also really, really open and we hope to be supporting it very, very formally in the near future to projects with, you know, quote unquote, non-traditional broadcast or distribution methods, whether that's through YouTube or Vimeo or through a dedicated website we're pushing it out in that direction. There is no potential way I see this future or the NEH growing in this space and continuing to live and thrive. And to be quite honest with you, supporting both the current generation of filmmakers who are moving in that direction or an entire younger generation who are almost exclusively working in that space. It's not gonna happen if we don't make that shift too. So we are open to it. Our guidelines will reflect that <coughs> shortly that we're very much hoping and encouraging those sorts of projects. <laughs> and when you consider in some ways that NEH is funding in the late 70s and early 80s set the field of documentary as we know it, not just through Ken Burns, but through a number of different projects that really did establish both the format and in, in some ways the distribution mechanism for documentary filmmaking. We're hoping to be able to make the same impact in some ways, at least, you know, in, a, in whatever small way we can with a newer generation of filmmakers and a newer way of looking at um, what's possible here. So we're open to ideas. We're open to innovation in this space. I would say that one of the key things is even outside of having that, you know, potentially that letter from a local station for willing and their willingness to present a program. You know, if you're working online there too, outreach and programming and educational support and curricular guides and all of that still applies potentially even more so. Um, so while it's nice and it would be nice to say to have, uh, you know, with WPT, on board as a partner for even distributing short videos online. We're open to projects that have figured this out on their own. So the one I mentioned before on Ladylike with the series of short films isn't actually partnering with anyone formal on that side, at least in terms of PBS stations. But they have partners on the ground at museums across the country, at community centers, at spaces and organizations that have focused on voting rights or women's suffrage. And those kind of things I think are exciting because it does offer a different network to tap on, a different audience type, a different way of looking at what outreach and distribution means for us. So we recognize that shift has to happen. Um, you know, change comes slow in the government too. So we're doing what we can in order to support that, but expect something more formal down the line. But by all means, if you're moving in that direction now, get in touch with us, we're open to it. We're working with our reviewers to understand that as we review these projects and as they quite frankly become a significant portion of what we see coming in here. Okay, well that kind of leads to this next question which is coming again from um, the history department at UW La Crosse, Ariel Bougeau is asking, <clears throat> how much do we need to stay away from social justice work right now? Is there a shift going on toward funding projects that are more apolitical? Um, I mean, this is NEH's, we get this question often, and I think it's, you know, on the one hand, the humanities are so central to so much of what our discussion is nationally right now and locally, that it's really tough to separate some of this from contemporary issues. And I think, honestly, there's a real dishonesty in a certain project. If you're dealing with a topic and not at least partially um, acknowledging that it may have contemporary resonances. But the NEH's traditional role in this space is that we don't fund projects that advocate. We can't do that. We can't fund projects that advocate for a specific law, a specific course of action, or anything that may be in some ways construed as a call to action for certain types of activities or ways of approaching um, legislation or, or things like that. That has been the NEH's role across the board. Of course, we're dealing with that more now, I think, as projects and, and producers really do want to find relevancy in their work and address um, contemporary issues. Uh, so what we ask of most projects is that, look, if you're dealing with a topic like, say, immigration that does have really hot button possibilities in the midst of this, 
that you've prepared for that and that you've accounted for those sorts of things, both in the proposal and both in the deep, deep side of the project itself, that you're offering multiple perspectives on an issue instead of just one. That if in some ways you're dealing with um, you know, something that has the potential to blow up, that you've figured out ways and frameworks of constraining that and maybe finding things like buffer text, for example, shared media that can be worked through in say community conversations or public programming grants, or topics that may have a historical precedent that may also have contemporary <coughs> residency, yet you allow for some of that stuff to be implicit and generative, because honestly, I think that's better storytelling anyways. But it's just that blatant use of, of taxpayer-funded dollars, essentially, to advocate against either government action or some kind of social change or social justice that we can't get behind, but we haven't gotten behind. But really, I think, again, Projects are finding incredible ways of raising these issues, of deepening content, of deepening ways of understanding our world, the world that was, our cultures, the socioeconomics even of a lot of what we're all going through without maybe even specifically putting their finger on it. So there are ways through this, talk to us about it. It's everywhere right now. And I think uh, you know, we have to figure out our own role in that too. But what we've best found is you know, we, we one, we have that policy established, but two, it really is a project by project thing. Um, and that, you know, the good inventive use of the humanities is one that allows for those broader contexts to be used as a way of understanding and filtering both the past, but the present, and also the future. So a project that leans too far on that side anyways is probably limiting what they're doing in terms of scholarship to begin with. So we'll oftentimes help people try to broaden that out, even if there isn't necessarily a course for advocacy or action or something like that. And I'll ask a follow up. You said buffer text. Yeah, um, yeah. Can you explain yeah, that, that's an odd phrase that I, I threw out there. But one of the things that we require now for our community conversations grant program is that they're centered around a media of some sort or a medium or an exhibit. So that might be a series of novels, it might be a film, it might be a film set, it could be a digital project, it could be like with Michigan Humanities, a museum on Main Street exhibit that's traveling to different towns as a neutral space for conversation to start and a space for that conversation to productively really take place um, between communities that may not have much in common. So we're looking for common ways of breaking that ground and finding a, you know, something, whether that is, again, a book reading across a town or a single film screening that allows for people to have that neutral space. It's been so, so productive in these programs that we now require it. So that's what I mean essentially by a buffer text. It's an, a way of inoculizing potential controversy and giving people the ability to talk through issues um, in a way that gives them some kind of central focus mechanism. Okay, I've got another question here, and this is a real nuts and bolts one, but it's good to get to, um, about the difference between implementation grants and planning grants. Yeah, um, that is the, a key difference for us, and we oftentimes see projects struggle with that even more so than the content that they're actually trying to focus on. Generally, a planning grant, if we're talking about an exhibit or um, something that has to do with our museums program uh, or historic sites program, a planning grant allows for you to simply get the foundation of the program intact, for the exhibit mm -hmm. intact. It is primary purpose at the planning level is to take what you've already done in terms of finding a, a piece of content or a, an event or whatever sort of foundational um, humanities approach you have and getting scholars in the room with curators, exhibit designers, and moving forward with that potential project, getting a blueprint for it, for example. On the film side or the media production side, our development grants or our planning grants are specifically almost across the board used for scripting. There are other uses that are allowed. So, you know, if you've got a partial script intact, you need the time to assemble a rough cut. We're okay with that too, in terms of planning, but they're generally used to do the same sort of thing. Get scholars in the room with the producers, really, really get down to the nuts and bolts of the content, what's gonna stick, develop themes, figure out ways of really making this come alive and present a project blueprint for moving forward. Implementation and production grants, need to be, for lack of a better phrase, shovel ready on that side. They need to have everything intact from a script, even if we know in documentary film, for example, that that's gonna change. But a walkthrough, say, on the museum side of an exhibit with sample text panels, with actual layouts in terms of the floor and the artifacts, and lists like that all need to be intact. 
our planning grants and our development grants really do credential you for that level. But just to be clear, you don't have to have received one to come in at that stage if you feel that you're already there. Okay, thank you. Um, I missed this before when I moved on, I'm sorry, but there was a follow-up about the buffer text. Great, yeah. Um, is it okay if a buffer text has a political slant? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, you know, we're dealing with a lot of this stuff. So I could imagine, you know, down in Kentucky, for example, they may really be leaning on Robert Penn Warren's work at this point. You know, there may be something like that that really does resonate contemporarily. So that kind of thing's great. But again, it's just the degree that, to which, you know, we're not talking or training people in, in the role of advocates or advocacy in that direction. But having political slants and discussing political issues is certainly fine on that side. Um, you know, we're okay with that. And if part of the framework of what you're doing is teaching people how to discuss political events, for example, in both historical context, but also present day things, yeah, I think something like that would be difficult to avoid. So civic space sorts of, of discussions, um, you know, necessarily would have something along those lines. We just ask that those present perspectives are multifaceted. And that doesn't mean, you know, that we're, what we're talking about is, you know, that you have to acquiesce in some ways to a, a certain kind of bipartisanship in this stuff. We don't mean it quite like that. We just mean that we want a full picture presented of any scenario, or any piece of content that you really are focusing on because it allows for those voices in some ways to become crucial to it. And it, honestly, in some ways, it's the best outreach you can do is to allow for voices that are unheard or in some ways, um, maybe not the dominant ones in a conversation to find expression through a text or through a film or through something like that. Mm -hmm. I really heard you say a lot um, that the complexity of, of human existence is really what you want to celebrate. In, in yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, these, nothing we deal with in the humanities is clear cut. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as I said at the conference a couple days ago, the reason for that, the beautiful, beautiful reason for that is just how messy the humanities um, you know, we know the historical record, but it changes. We can interpret a piece of literature, but that's really subjective in some ways too, and wholly personal. All of those productive spaces in between there are what we should be, you know, exploiting and celebrating and really complicating through the projects that we fund here at the NEH. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, as far as a paradigm goes, the central one of what we hope to do. Um, I have a question for you, and then I have another um, question from uh, from our callers. Um, that it's like a radio show here. I know. <laughs> I feel like I'm hosting a radio show. Long right? time any fan, first time caller. <laughs> well, I want to hear, um, as a follow up to what you just said, how you define the humanities to people. Um, we have a definition on our website. It's every bit as clunky as uh, you might expect. Um, we try not to define it all that succinctly and there, there's a reason for that i mean look the fields that we're involved in stretch everywhere from as i said before history literature jurisprudence philosophy ethics civics linguistics language all of those sorts of things that we traditionally even sort of tangentially associate with the humanities we're more or less open to those kinds of projects social science work even bleeds in there at some points too even if it is you know in some cases on the more quantitative side so we purposely want you to make a case for why something is the humanities on that side. Mm -hmm. We are open to it, to be blunt. That's actually part of what the application is for, mm -hmm. is to show you showcasing why something has exigency in the humanities and has resonance within that project. So we're open to this. Um, but again, I know this is also something that's debated quite often now in contemporary academic settings too, about the traditional role of the humanities, the way it's been established to serve certain purposes and how in some ways it's an arbitrary designation that should now include things like say media studies or something like that. We're okay with all that. Um, we are open to projects that really skirt that line too. It's up to you to convince us just how to do that though and to how to express that, and how to move the field forward at that point. So I don't wanna to be too prescriptive here either because I think again, some of the best projects that we've had funded are the ones that really do border on something else. Uh, we funded a digital game at the prototyping level recently called Age of Alchemy from what is used to be the Chemical Heritage Foundation and uh, it's now the Science History Institute. And part of the game is actually teaching players how to work through different chemical combinations, what alchemy is, 
very, very scientific types of dimensions. But the game itself is drawing from the Science Heritage Fund or Science History Institute's incredible archive of humanistic expressions of science over time. Paintings, artifacts, journals from people who are working in that space to narrativize that content and to make it more rooted and contextualized in history and in culture. So we are okay with skirting those lines. We are okay, again, with projects that do lean at some points towards more STEM-oriented types of discussions or activities. Um, we are purposely, very purposely, underdefining the humanities as a result. Thank you. We are coming up uh, to 12 o'clock, so we got about five minutes until 12. We can certainly go over, but I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I have got one more very practical question. Um, when is the next deadline for sure. digital projects uh, for the public? And um, yeah, specifically about proposal deadlines. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, let me outline that program really quickly because I haven't yet. So digital project for the public has an annual deadline of June. That may change, we may offer another, who knows? But right now we know that next June, for sure, we will have our next deadline. That also means you have a good 10 months to either get involved with that project, start to sort one out, talk to us, um, or you know maybe consider a different option at some point in another program. Every June is digital projects for the public, and we do that with, for a very simple reason. A deadline in June means that we can rush through awards and give notification in around late November-ish, which in the federal government, believe it or not, is light speed in terms of submission and award notification. And since so many of these projects rely on the fact that, one, they're using technologies that in some ways may be outmoded if you're waiting longer than that. And two, um, some of these projects, especially on the digital side where the infrastructure and funding mechanisms are less robust, it's a hard thing to hold together, that team. We offer support at three different levels in this program, discovery, prototyping, and production. The discovery level is the one that I really am consistently the most excited about because I think what NEH offers in terms of funding there doesn't exist in any other funder. Um, it is essentially a consult plan, and it's $30,000 that can be used towards conversations, convenings, really consultations with scholars or content experts and media producers to map out the best path forward. And that includes, in some cases, actually choosing a platform. So we've had projects that we funded at the discovery level, like one from um, Gallup Arts out in New Mexico, who weren't sure exactly what they were going to do with their digitized collection of New Deal artwork, for example. So they brought in a web designer, they brought in museum curators, they brought in game designers to cast a wide net and use that funding as a way of winnowing down some of the possibilities there. Now, on the other hand, we haven't funded nearly enough of those. Um, I think it's been, a, you know, in some level, uh, a, an attempt from us to try to seed the field, but we want to fund more of those types of projects. And in terms of getting proposals from institutions that may be coming into the NEH for a first time, like a Gallup Arts did, this is a great way of both acclimating to the process, but also figuring out and allowing for NEH funds to help to develop and capacity build um, a project or an institution to really move forward to the next steps. Uh, we offer prototyping grants too um, for $100,000, and those are really those vertical slices the, it gives you the ability to go out and build a key feature or proof of concept of the project, test it, move forward, even consider possibilities for outreach and audience evaluation in the midst of it. And then we offer production grants, which I think last round topped out at about 400,000, and they're everything you might expect. Finalizing the project, polishing it, getting out into the world, doing evaluation and testing. We fund public programming around that too. We fund outreach and the ability to do outreach uh, through that grant line. So you can actually put funding in there to do some, some uh, community building work or awareness building for the project. And we hope that projects like that, that reach that stage, really do have um, the ability in some ways, not to just reach, you know, not to just address some of the local concerns, but oftentimes projects like that break through. So we funded uh, a project from historic Hudson Valley, for example, on slavery in the North. And they actually were one of the few who have come in at every level, discovery, prototyping, and production. And what they're doing is telling a story that's very regionalized in some sense in that it does address and really interact with some of their on-site exhibits and content to tell the story, the really complicated story 
of slave owners in the North and the enslaved who really had to struggle with this odd, difficult space where um, freedom was, was just a, a word in some ways. But this project's going to break out, I imagine, from that space. And I think they recognize that in the midst of some of their testing and prototyping, and they've adjusted content to do that. So there's ways of focusing this and ways of even, again, building your project's potential to move past a certain space in the midst of these grant categories. But um, as of right now, next June is the next deadline for that. Um, our other two grant programs, media projects, and then museums, exhibits, historic sites, and community conversations, are offered in both August and in January. So we have another deadline coming up for that too. And you're well within the sweet spot if you're interested in those programs to start to consider a project or a proposal. Just let us know, get in touch, and uh, we're happy to walk you through. Thank you. I want to invite anybody else who has a question that they want to um, ask Mark and address right now to go ahead and submit that. Um, otherwise, I know that he'll invite you to be in touch with him personally. I have one more question um, about, and I think this is a really interesting one, about how the NEH and the NEA work together mm, and specifically yeah. um, when you were talking about production of things like films, um, how is that not an NEA proposal? Is there overlap? Um, and this gets, of course, at the heart of you know, how the arts and the humanities yeah, work yeah. together. Yeah, I mean, NEA does, you know, even through their model, which doesn't specifically fund um, individuals or individual projects, they do nonetheless support filmmaking. They do support the media arts. They do support gaming and things like that in the art space um, through their funding of organizations and institutions and conferences and convenings and community place-based art making. All of that sort of thing does cross over with us. The difference really at its core is the type of content that we wind up privileging at the NEH, the type of research and the ways that that's framed in the midst of these projects. Art for art's sake really does exist, and it exists so vibrantly at the arts endowment, and that the need and the ability for communities to do that kind of work is an end in itself. We're, in some sense, a more storytelling-based organization, and one that leans more towards audience takeaways and learning goals and the ability to communicate the richness of the humanities through our project. Now the crossovers do occur. Um, Walden a Game, for example, was funded initially actually by an arts endowment grant to um, a couple of organizations that got it off the ground. And then the NEH stepped in and provided some pretty, pretty significant funding at the prototyping and production level to actually get it through to the finish line. And I'm glad I mentioned that actually because uh, one of the things that you'll see in the slides that I'll send you is that we're quite proud of Walled in the Game. It's won Game of the Year awards, uh, most significant impact, and it was just released even for the PlayStation 4. Uh, but one of the things we really want to do is make sure that it's out there in the on the ground, in the classroom, in the community centers, in spaces where people can use it. So it's free to anyone who's working with those spaces, either educationally or elsewhere. So I will include a link for that. You have to fill out a quick form, and you'll be sent a download license that you can actually install on as many computers as you want to. Um, so we're thrilled about that. And the Arts Endowment was a big part in really pushing for that too. We do want all of our grant products to be available to some section of the public uh, for free. These are taxpayer dollars. So for a museum exhibit, for example, they may open their doors to school groups for a certain amount of time. Film on that level can't just be something to pay for. There has to be some way of engaging it um, for free by a general public audience. Um, but we don't expect, on the other hand, that you're taking a hit, say, for example, if you've got a three-year exhibit there, that your doors are open the entire time. So there's a sweet spot to that that we're still trying to find with digital projects, especially ones like Walden, that really do have AAA or high-level production values and are being released as such to compete with the titles that are out there that you may find in your home or your children's bedrooms or something like that. The big games, this type of stuff that's out there. This is our attempt to wade into that market too, but we do want this to really be out there and used. So that kind of stuff matters. Um, and uh, you know, on that side, I, I really think that there's a lot of possibility here to, uh, to develop projects that, that skirt those sorts of lines and can work productively there. Thank you. I've gotten a bunch of thank yous here from people who um, are really appreciative of this information. Well, thank it's you for joining really, me. Really helpful. Can I just ask one question of you? Um, we maybe don't have time to address this today, but. I would love, and I said this at the outset, I really think 
one thing we don't do enough as an agency is listen to your needs for grant lines and support on that level. Um, doesn't always mean we can accommodate it, but if we hear enough of something from the field, we absolutely will make an attempt to do that. So for example, in digital, is the discovery level, you know, and this is a question I ask quite often of the program, is the discovery level already too far removed? Would it be useful, for example, to have a smaller grant even before that to do evaluative work of what it takes to make digital projects possible at your institution? You know, do you need those smaller, smaller grants um, for other types of, of uh, projects or platforms or ways of moving forward? Are there something that you see in our, in our guidelines in terms of, say, historic sites that don't make sense for your institution or that make assumptions about the field that you think aren't accurate? Any of that stuff, we need to hear it. We need that fun, that real, that feedback because, you know, in a very real sense, we are simply stewards of this role of this money of this funding of the field you're the ones out there doing this and you have the perspectives that we need to ensure are there so please send me any suggestions you have if you're working through a guideline and you have questions or we're wondering about the possibilities for funding a certain type of work we are all ears and i think we have a good degree of latitude to use that really responsibly nowadays as a way of filling in the gaps in our funding regionally, geographically, but also demographically, and even in terms of the types of projects that we fund and how we fund them. We want this money to matter. And if that means in some cases, either giving larger grants or smaller ones, where we'd be able to really funnel that, that humanities perspective through projects at a very, very base scale, we're all for it. But we need to hear it from you in order to make that happen. Thank you for that really sincere invitation. So I hope everyone can, um, can give some thought to that and uh, take Mark up on that offer. So the email that I'll follow up with um, will include Mark's contact information. You do already have that too. I'll also send along everybody who's been a part of this call. And um, thank you all for taking the time to listen in. I, um, I would love to end by just asking you, Mark, for those of you who are still here, if you care to, to listen, I'm just curious, you know, in a really personal way, you've answered a lot about how you represent the NEH, but in a really personal way, um, we've been talking a lot about why the humanities matter to us and why we are doing this work. And I just wonder if you want to share your own story or your own personal um, sort of why statement about how you got involved and, and why this matters to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, the endowment is, you know, it's an institution in some ways that is far more um, metaphorically representative of what we're doing in this country than it is in very brass tacks, financially representative of it. We're a small agency. We're an agency with a budget that nonetheless has increased in the last two fiscal cycles, but nonetheless, we're still small. And our work and our mission is really enabled by the stuff that you do on the ground. And we say that so sincerely. You know, we don't exist without your work. And it's humbling to be a part of that public service, taking a turn from you know, more independent production and academically leaning stuff like I was in heading towards, toward this idea of public service, it's a humbling one. And the work that we see matter, you know, the transformative conversations that take place across two communities, say in Florida, that haven't interacted in years, who share churches but don't share community spaces, the films that are out there, that really allow us to, to have a dialogue centered on a piece of media, whether it's Ken Burns Vietnam or something that's coming out more recently on say, um, Marian Anderson or Ruth Benedict. Uh, I think all of these things matter as a shared history, a shared consciousness, a shared way of reflecting what it means to be American. And as nationalistic in some ways as that sometimes gets skewed, we really do feel as if, you know, there are core pieces of who we are that we've just begun to interrogate. And I can't say enough how the expression of these projects, the deep, deep affinity for the humanities that we all have, we just don't call it that, is so central to what we do. And it's humbling, it is. Um, I, I think, you know, this conversation came up at the games conference here earlier this week, just how much work we do in the humanities without saying so, um, whether that is through engaging literature or history or even speaking on a local level about, you know, say, the, the cracks in the side of a building that used to be a stairwell from a previous space, or running your hand across that and finding ways of engaging that and telling those stories, it's everywhere. 
Um, it's our job to make that manifest. And uh, to the degree that you, you folks help us do it, it's, um, it's awfully inspiring. So this is a roundabout way of saying that, you know, I think it's a core of what we do. I think it matters more than ever. And, um, you know, the robustness of the agency and what it's done and really its resiliency over the years and recently is all a reflection of the work that's going on out there and the maybe not always clearly enunciated, but nonetheless, clearly, clearly foundational work of the humanities in this country. So Thank that's you. it. Thank you all so much. And um, we're really glad to have had you here and I hope this inspires you in many new ways. And we look forward to hearing from you here at the Humanities Council too. Um, I'll let Meg and Dina say goodbye as well. Thank you all so much for, for yeah. joining us. Thanks and be in touch with us. us. <laughs> we, uh, we look forward to hearing more from you all. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you.